Calabi and welcome to Business of Life. First off, I owe you guys a little apology. We're going to spend this episode talking about a subject that can be really depressing, the end of your life. But it's going to happen and any long-term financial plan has to include mortality, right? Yours and your family's. Now look, we're not saying you have to think about this stuff all the time, but every now and then, it's probably good to ask, what will the rest of my life look like? And will our society be able to take care of us? Well, tonight we're going to find out, and as always, we'll break down the issues in facts, figures, dollars and cents. I'm joined by a panel of brilliant experts trying to answer the question, what is the business of ageing? So I want to start off with a quick poll of the room, actually. How many people here have ever had to care for an elderly relative? Raise your hand. Whoa. That brings me nicely to our first statistic. In 2015, more than one in four adults with a parent over 65 said they helped them financially. And just like you guys, those caregivers aren't necessarily as old as some people might think. One in four caregivers is between 18 and 34. Joan, that's got to be hard. These people are managing jobs. They're trying to have lives outside of this, right? But isn't that an eye-opener? I mean, the average caregiver in America is a woman who's 49, who has a family, she's taking care of her home, and now all of a sudden she takes on essentially a second job. And there are consequences to that. To her finances, she's 30% less likely to remain in the workforce full time. She won't take job promotions and raises. She'll probably leave that job early. She won't be putting into pensions. She won't be putting into Social Security. Women caregivers are 80% more likely to find themselves impoverished or even living below the poverty level. I had a grandmother who died recently. She was 98 when she died. And for about 20 years, it, was, it took four adults full time taking care of her. It became a job, a second job for everyone in the family. And she had home care give her. That stress has such an incredible impact on your physical health. 30% mm. of caregivers end up dying before the people that they are caring for. There is an incredible. increase in obesity, hypertension, high blood pressure, they're alone. And presumably some of those physical sicknesses are also keeping those young caregivers out of the workforce, right? Sure, out of the workforce and out of the dating pool. I mean, when you look at that statistic, one out of four caregivers are 18 to 34. A lot of people are single mm. now, 18 to 34, right? So this is a responsibility that falls on you, that, does, that you can't often share with a partner, and that keeps you from even getting the kind of partner that can lead to the sort of financial stability that you need later in life. So there are all sorts of ripple effects. Yeah. Let's turn to you guys. What's your feeling on this? Hi. Hey, you doing, Mona? Both my parents are pretty much up there in age, and as much as no one really wants to think about losing a loved one, especially your parents. Um, how does someone prepare for such a transition? Talk to them. You know, most people today say, I don't want to leave my home because I'm going to go in a nursing home and die. That's really not the world we live in. Most people go into a myriad of new senior living opportunities from a robust senior community where you can all swim in the pool or be at it's the like tennis college. court. It's almost like kind of college all over again. And then it goes on to assisted living, and there are about eight levels of care in assisted living. I mean, you have to have that conversation. I want to talk about some of the costs of these care homes, though. So let's bring okay. up our next statistic. On average, it costs more than $45,000 a year to hire a home health aide. If you move your loved one into a shared room at a nursing home, it will cost around about $82,000 a year. And a private room will run you more than $92,000 a year. And so that is more than some Americans make in a year, right? So how are people paying for this? Most people aren't. About two thirds of the people who are in assisted living nursing home facilities, it's being paid for by Medicare and Medicaid. Okay. The difference though, is that not all homes accept Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stay somewhere where you're sort of recognizable, where everything's familiar, that's great, but you're gonna have to pay for it. And that means maybe taking out long-term care insurance or saving for it starting when you're pretty young. That's some really useful advice, but what about your own retirement? If you're like most young people, it's not a pretty picture. Take a look at this. 64% of young people don't think social security will be able to pay for them when they retire. Despite that fear, 41% of young people have saved a grand total of zero dollars for their retirement. Backtrack for a minute, Lynette. Can you explain how it is that Social Security is supposed to work? Social Security is supposed to be uh, a pool that Americans put a, uh, you know, a percentage of their income in with every paycheck. The problem is, because our parents' generation is so large, um, we just don't have enough to go around right now, it seems, for our demographic shifts in terms of paying for people as they age. And not only that, but there are a lot of Americans right now that are dipping into their own oh, totally. retirement funds in order to take care of parents who never dreamed they would live 
as long as they're living. And can we, can we say that sort of as a, as a point also, please never dip into your retirement accounts for anything except retirement? But what, what, yeah. what, what are there other alternatives? Yeah, what can they do well, there, are, there are some alternatives, right? If you, have a, if you have a home, you can maybe take out a home equity loan. Mm -hmm. if, you, you know, if you've been lucky enough to own property, you can borrow money from other people in your family. It's just retirement accounts should be, to the degree possible, they should be sacrosanct. I want to hear from some of the audience about this topic. So who here has a question about retirement? I'm 23, and I want to start thinking about saving for my retirement, but my job right now, I don't make that much money. So do you have any tips on how to start? Yes. <laughs> Put aside a little bit, and it doesn't matter how much. Think about how much you pay for cable, or think about getting rid of cable and putting that money somewhere else. Right? She'll never do that. <laughs> I oh, you know what? We take cable. No, millennials take cable. I use Netflix now. OK, so. she uses yeah, Netflix. Yeah, exactly, okay. right? But think about anywhere you can cut down on the big ticket items, um, and then shift that money into a different account. Put, and automate this kind as of much account? as possible. You can make different checking accounts for yourself. You can make different savings accounts for yourself. There are apps that will do this for you. It is pretty amazing these days. Use technology to your advantage, right? And make it automatic so that you don't have to think about it every month. Some of that money, before you get a chance to spend it, it goes away. It disappears and it goes into somewhere blessed, some blessed peaceful space where it just compounds the interest and you will not see it again until you are 70, but you will be so grateful to yourself for having done it. Let's cut that conversation and move on. We've been talking a lot about the huge cost of aging, but it doesn't end when your life does. Let's talk about America's funeral industry. Here are the median costs for a funeral in the United States. First, you've got to pay for something called a non-declinable service fee. Then there's the removal and transfer of the remains. Then embalming and prep, facilities and staff for the ceremony, person transportation, your basic memorial, printed packages, that's the program they give you on the day of, then the cheapest metal casket, all of that brings you to a grand total of $7,181. That's the median cost of a funeral in the US right now. And by the way, that doesn't even include a burial plot or headstone. It does seem like it's a lot of money. Does no one here think that that's a lot of money? Does anyone here think that's a lot of money? Oh, it's a lot of money. It's a yeah. lot of money. We're and being like, overcharged for everything. I mean, I know, but it seems like it's kind flat. of different when it's about funerals. Come on, that's yeah, like... But, you can, but it's still a business, right? right. You can't expect yeah. them not to make money just because you're in an emotionally fraught and fragile state. Yeah. What are, the, what are the alternatives to so, avoid this expensive cost? Pretty much the cheapest you can do it for if you get a cremation without a memorial service is about 725 bucks. Okay. All things considered, that's not that expensive. But that's also kind of doing it Big Lebowski style. You know, that's like a coffee can instead of a nice urn. And, you know, no, no ceremony with people singing or speaking necessarily at all. You can donate your body to science. That'll save you some cremation costs. Um, there's also something called a body farm. And I felt better about life before I learned that. But they <laughs> will take your body and use it to study decomposition and other sort of scientific matters. Wow. So you're making a contribution that way. And if you want, you can just let your loved one's bodies go entirely unclaimed. And Los Angeles takes care of about 5,000 unclaimed bodies a year that it will just, you know, deal with on its own. Um, but so we don't have paupers' graves anymore. We don't, you know, throw people in a pit and cover them with quicklime. Not in America. Let me just say, and it can cost a lot more than that $7,000. Right. I would highly recommend, and nobody wants to do this, but I literally sat down with my mom and my brother. Ironically, like right before my brother passed away, I went through this exercise because I had read about it. And had I not done that, I never would have known that he wanted to be cremated and that he wanted to be put in with my, my dad. I went through it with my mom, and she like designed a primetime special. <laughs> she really did. She, you know, everybody she wanted there, and who she wanted to have sing and what she wanted them to sing. These are things that you don't necessarily want to have to think about. I mean, I did this with my mom. I helped her write literally her obituary. It was years before she ever did it, but she wanted to have a say in what was said. Mm. When you finally get that call or that final breath is taken and you all of a sudden have to do all this and you have to say, gee, I wonder what she would have liked to have had said you have an opportunity to do that ahead of time. Unfortunately, that does it for this edition of The Business of Life. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today, Lynette, Joan and Esther, and all of you for watching at home. We'll see you next time on The Business of Life. Bye-bye. The Business of Life is made possible by Better Money Habits. It's a free resource that helps you build practical knowledge and take control of your finances. Powered by Bank of America. See more at bettermoneyhabits.com.